the sin was public. It was undeniable. Apart from Jesus, we could say unforgivable. He had been caught. And when caught, we kind of all respond in the, in the same way. We, we say the right things. But how do we know that his public contrition was real? How do we know that, that he truly was more ashamed that he offended God than he was just embarrassed that he was caught by us? How do we know that our contrition is real? That our conviction for our sin is, is not just a position of self-defense in the midst of public prosecution, but instead is a humbled, contrite, repentant response before God. Outwardly, those two things look the same. How can we be certain of the difference? The story behind Psalm 51 is as familiar 3,000 years ago as it is ripped from today's headlines. I was 10 the first time I remember a politician being caught in an inappropriate sexual relationship. It was Gary Hart. And even at the age of 10, I understood that if you can't be loyal to your vow that you make to your spouse, then you probably can't be president of the United States. And so even at the age of 10, I understood that this wasn't going to work out for Gary, at least in this election. And yet we can have a laundry list of men that could go alongside that name. Gary Condon, Bill Clinton, John Kennedy. We could even list present names. It's not an unfamiliar story. And, and what contrasts with Psalm 51 and the story of, of David is, is how striking the difference between this mention and this story and, and his original mention in, in Holy Writ. The King Saul was the king of Israel, and, and he had offended God. He had, he, he had tried to, to dance in some ways with, with holiness and sinfulness all at the same time. God, God had warned him not to do that. God, God had told him that whenever he took over this nation, that he was to rid himself of all the uncleanliness of, of that nation. But, but Saul looked at it and saw the riches and thought to himself, I can remain holy while at the same time still enjoying the pleasures of, uh, of this sinful condition. He tried to be both things and he couldn't be. And God was done with him literally said, you are no longer my anointed one, and, and, and then he charged Samuel to go out and to anoint the new king of Israel. And, and so Samuel went. He was sent to, to Jesse, and Jesse had these successful sons. And, and God told the prophet, he said, I'll, I'll show you which one I want. And so Samuel shows up on the scene, and, and, and he sees the firstborn, the, the tall, striking, strong, clearly born type A leader, and he thinks that's going to be the king. That's the one I want to follow. And God says it's not him. Well, so often God chooses the second born. Not only uh, did he do it in Old Testament times, I think he did it in my family too. He, he, he chooses the second born as, as the favorite. And so the second born son comes along with many of the similar qualities, but with not all the mistakes of the first born. And, and Samuel thinks that's the one, but it wasn't him. Son three and four and five and six all passed before him. It's not any of the seven. And Samuel understands that God hasn't pointed out which one it's supposed to be, and yet God had sent him to this place to, to find the next king of Israel. And so he looks at Jesse and says, uh, do, you, do you have any other sons? And, and Jesse goes, yeah, yeah, there's the little one, the youngest one. He, he's out in the field. David is his name. And Jesse, uh, Samuel says, call him, call him to us. And as soon as David shows up, Samuel says, this is the one. For the Lord had told Samuel that, that man looks at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so while Samuel would be very tempted to look at these outward signs of success to say, here's the leader we want to follow, God was looking for the specific heart that he wanted to lead the nation of Israel. And this was the heart. It was David. And Samuel anointed David as the future king of Israel. But there was a problem. You had a future king, but you also had a, a present king. 
And, and so the, the books of First and Second Samuel in many ways show the, the tension that is there of, uh, of Saul, the rightful king of Israel, and yet uh, David, the, the anointed future king of Israel, and God's blessing on David and, and, and God's abandonment now in many ways of, uh, of Saul and, and the tension that is there and Saul and now having rebelled against God, having walked away from uh, God, uh, almost having God's spirit now removed from him, Saul begins to suffer many different ailments. And one of them is just this deep anxiety, this deep tension within his own soul. And he hears that, that there's somebody in the kingdom that has this great skill to, to play an instrument, a harp-like instrument. And Saul calls David to him. And David begins to play this instrument, and it gives Saul the sense of, of peace. And, and so Saul brings him in to the army and makes him just kind of the personal assistant now to the to the king, it's a, it's a blessing for David now to, to be in on the inner circle. And, and when the mighty giant Goliath is, is faced and, and the nation of Israel has to send one, one soldier out to fight Goliath, nobody else will do it. David is the one that steps up and says, I will do it. And he slaughters the giant. His popularity gains and, and so much admiration. Saul is amazed by his bravery and puts him now in charge of his entire army. And, and God begins to bless and, and, and there's so much success and, and so, so many great things are happening that Saul begins to grow jealous and, and now understands that, that the people want David to be king. They don't want him to be king. And so they, he thinks to himself, I better kill David or, or he's going to overthrow me. And Saul, Saul begins to pursue after David. And yet David is, is faithful in the midst of all of this, not to in any way fall to Saul's uh, axe, but instead to, or sword to go wherever he needs to go, and the Lord protects him, a sign of blessing. On multiple occasions, David now has the ability to kill Saul, and the people would have rejoiced. And he could have claimed that this is God's call of my life. I'm, I, I'm now called to be king. And, and, and so he could have justified it in a religious manner. But, uh, but David, in the midst of, of humility and obedience, says, this is not mine. That is not mine to take care of. And he spares Saul's life. The one who's trying to kill him, David now spares his life. And the Lord continues to, to bless. And finally, Saul dies. And, and David is anointed king of Israel. And God's blessings continue. Economic success. The Ark of the Covenant comes back into Jerusalem. The United Kingdom, the divided kingdom is now united. There's all these military battles that are won. And it's seemingly at the very height of God's blessing, at the height of his popularity, at the pinnacle of his own life that we hear of his downfall. And the story begins with such a minor, insignificant detail. It was the, the season of war, and, and so all the armies were out in war. But David was in Jerusalem. David was back home. And if we didn't know the rest of the story, if nothing else really happened, we wouldn't really think anything about it. Now, maybe he's showing good leadership here. Maybe he's trying to empower a new general, to, uh, to equip a new commander. And so maybe he sent him out with his instructions to, to give him the, the full freedom of leading. Now, maybe this was a minor war to some extent, and, and he didn't feel like his, his presence was demanded in this situation. Maybe there was something going on back home, more pressing issues that, that he needed to be back home. We don't know exactly why David is there, but what we do know is that, generally speaking, kings are with their armies, and David's not. It could be that, that all the weariness of doing well all those years had finally gotten to him. And he thought to himself, I've, I've suffered enough. I, I, don't, I don't need to do this anymore. I, it, it's time for somebody else to pay a price and not me. It, it could be a, a, an overconfidence of his own necessity of, uh, of him saying, I can't really risk my life. What would happen to the nation if, if I risk my life? And so, so I'll sacrifice the, uh, the sons of other people, but I'm not going to get out there and risk it on my own. It could be that he had gotten so caught up in the trappings of riches and fame that he really didn't want to rough it now uh, away from his throne. We don't know the exact reason that David wasn't with his army, but but we do know that it led him to a scene where one night he really couldn't sleep. And he's up on his balcony and he's overlooking all that is his. And he sees her. He, he sees something that he wants. 
And the first thought in his head is not a humble, Lord, she's not mine. Lord, thank you for her beauty, and thank you that she does not belong to me. Bless whatever man she belongs to. It should have been his thinking, but that wasn't his thought. His thought was, she's mine. I want her. I have to have her. And I notice something. Had David been where he was supposed to be? Had he been leading his army out in battle? Had he been where he was supposed to be? He would have never faced that temptation. He would have never experienced it. There are some temptations in our lives that that we're supposed to stand up to, that that we're supposed to experience, that we're supposed to be confronted with, and in the midst of the confrontation, that we're supposed to lean on Jesus, lean on His Spirit, lean on our trust in Him, and and, and with a boldness, with a moral compass, with a a kind of backbone about ourselves, uh, the Spirit now at, at work within us, we're supposed to stand up to that confrontation, stand up to that temptation, and refuse it. There are these moments that temptation is supposed to slap us in the face, and we're supposed to stand strong. But there's a great number of temptations that we don't have to face. That that if we will obey, if we will trust God with where He places us in life, and we will follow after Him, there's a great deal of temptations that we'll never be confronted with, that we'll never have to worry that we might fall for. Because in the midst of obedience, we won't face the urge. Had David been obedient in what he was called to do and what he was supposed to do, he would have faced temptations. But not Bathsheba. And how interesting is it? David in some way was experiencing what we all long for. Wealth and riches and power and freedom, the Freedom of choice that allowed him to do whatever it is that he wanted to do. And that freedom of choice now led him to a balcony, uh, resting, maybe watching the sunset, overlooking everything that was his. And that's what led him to temptation. It was the war that was in part God's protection of David's heart. The war should have consumed his mind. The the war should have commanded him to a different location. The the war should have put him in in a specific place. Not that he would have been totally free from all temptation, but he would have been freed from this temptation. Have you ever thought for a moment... That the chaos in your life sometimes, the things that are, 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 are driving your decision-making and your thought process, the, the demands that are upon you, have you ever thought for a moment that sometimes the, the distractions of life, the, uh, the situations of life are actually a sign of God's protection that are keeping you from some of the temptations that you could not withstand? That if you didn't have the responsibility of work tomorrow, you might fall in a way that you can't even begin to imagine. That if you had all the money and all the power and all the influence, that your heart is capable of doing far more evil than you could ever even imagine. And so in part, your financial limitations, your time restrictions, in part, just the responsibilities that you have tomorrow is an aspect of God's protection of your own heart. But David had walked a different way, and he saw her, and he wanted her. Now, I don't blame the messengers. We live in a different day, in a, in a different time. Back, back then, you didn't question the king. You didn't con- confront a king, but But whenever he said, she's mine, whenever he inquired about her, whenever he said, hey, go fetch her for me, was there any possibility for one of those messengers to say, hang on now, sir, she's not yours. Do you understand what you're doing? Do you see how you're about to overstep a boundary? Was there any freedom there? If the answer is no, that's not the fault of the messengers, it's the fault of the leader. If you're a leader and nobody can tell you no, if you surround yourself by people who who don't understand that they are empowered, not just with the right, but with the actual responsibility of, uh, of protecting you from yourself, that's your own fault. 
A good leader here should understand the nature of his own heart. David should understand the temptations that were before him, that, that he needed help, that he needed protection. It was, it was David's responsibility to equip and empower a, a friendship group, a, a, a family group, a, a work group now around him that, that loves him so much that, that they are willing to say the difficult things to him, to say, say no, sir, you, you don't need to go this way. No, sir, this isn't a, a good idea. No, sir, she's not yours. That is now willing to, to risk their responsibility, willing now to risk the relationships that they have with the king because they love him so much, they're willing to risk it all for his well-being. Do you have somebody in your life like that? Now, I, I pray that, that if I go down the path of sin, that in order to get to the end of that path, that, that I have to step through a lot of you to get there. Now, I, I pray that there are people in my life who will, who will call me out, who will say, no, sir, this isn't yours. No, sir, this isn't the way to go. No, sir, are you willing to throw it all away here? Do you not recognize what you're doing? I hope there are people that will spout my sermons back to me, spout Scripture back to me, throw the Spirit back in my face and say, no, Kevin, this is not the direction that you want to go. Who can tell you no? Over whose body are you going to have to step in order to sin? If the answer is nobody, then you are greatly overestimating your own heart. For there is nobody in this room who is so pure and so perfect, who when faced with the right temptation at just the right moment, won't begin to walk toward it. And we're supposed to love each other so much that for you to get there, you're going to have to go through me first. Now, I know it's not always easy, and, and if we were in deep testimony time with a great deal of privacy, I could begin to list names of people who no longer go here because this church body tried to love them and, and, and was saying, don't go there. And in pride, they went there and they no longer go here. It's not easy, but it's what we need. It's what David needed in the moment. Now, now, there was a messenger. There was a messenger. We don't fully know the full content, but there was a messenger that, that showed some courage in which David said, hey, go get her for me. And that messenger said, isn't, isn't that Bathsheba? The daughter of, I can't remember their name, and the wife of Uriah? Notice that's a, that's a three-pronged warning set in the humility of a question. Hey, I could be wrong. I, I could be wrong here, but isn't that Bathsheba? Bathsheba, a, an individual. Bathsheba, a person. Not, not Bathsheba, a sex toy here. Not, not Bathsheba, just an object that you can do with whatever you want to get. Isn't this a real person that's there? Uh, the messenger in that, in that moment in, in humility said, hey, this is a real person. See what this is, David. Before you go there, before you destroy her, at least see who she is as a person, as an individual, not as an object. It's a warning. But David didn't wake up. It, it, isn't she the the daughter of somebody? Now placing her in the context of a family? And now, now showing that, that she's not just in isolation, but, but the decisions that she makes, the choices that she makes, the, the decisions that are made upon her that, that she has to endure and, and deal with those circumstances now have a ripple effect. It, it affects a family as well, David. David, notice what you're going to do here. Whenever you go and make her your own, you're not just going to hurt her. You're not just going to have a ripple effect in your own family. You're now going to hurt her family as well. Isn't she the wife of Uriah? And now personalizing it in a very real way, Uriah, one of your best warriors? Uriah, who, who's out on the field right now, sacrificing his life possibly for you. It's a warning here, David. Understand the, the larger picture of what's going on, the, uh, the vision of what is taking place here. This is not just going to be a one-time act. It's not just that you're going to flirt with her for a little bit and, and nothing's going to come of it in any way. You're headed down a path you don't want to go here. Isn't that who she is? Think about the courage that it took just to say that. Had that been taken the wrong way, the, the king could have said, what are you trying to imply here? And in a self-righteous way, he could have now killed the messenger. 
But even that three-pronged warning didn't wake him up. And he sent for him. Now, the story as told in 2 Samuel 15 is, is told as a story of two consenting adults. But, but it's not totally wrong to now begin to look at this text through the current Me Too movement and go, hang on now, this, this seems off a little bit. Could Bathsheba really consent? Did, did she really have a, a power over her own body in this situation? Did she really have the ability to tell the king no and not face any ramifications or repercussions because of it? It's unlikely. In the same way that, like it or not, if you're the boss and she works for you, there's not always a clear ability to have consent because the power structure is not equal. We don't know fully what went on here because the text doesn't tell it in that way. It, the text illustrates it in, in the concept of two consenting adults. Interesting, though, it doesn't so much imply that Bathsheba sinned. Putting the weight now on David. We don't know if it was a one-time, one-night affair or, or an ongoing situation. It doesn't really matter. Trust was, was broken. The, uh, the, the situation occurred. In all likelihood, it was it was more than just one night because she had an ability to communicate with the king in a way that maybe a, a one-night stand wouldn't. If you, you know, if you read the old stories about, well, I can't go there. But it was going to be funny. It was a baseball story. You know, Derek Jeter. Okay, I just went there. If you, if you hooked up with Derek Jeter, you would get a signed baseball and some money. But you wouldn't have any way to contact him back. Bathsheba was able to contact Derek Jeter back. And, and so, in all likelihood, it was an ongoing relationship of some sort, and, and she finally sent word, I'm pregnant. Well, now, now we got a problem. Everything was fine as long as it was private. David had written in his mind this, uh, this human deception, this human lie that, that sexual acts really don't mean much. It's, it's just two bodies and, and, and physical engagement, and so it only means something in that moment. And, and so there are no ripple effects. There are no ramifications. It's a denial of the spiritual aspect of sex. It's a denial of the emotional connections uh, of sex. It's a denial of, of how our private lives do have these very public ramifications. And, and he had written the story that as long as nobody knows about it, everything he's going to be okay, but now it was going to become obvious. And so David had to do something about it. Now, I've watched so much 48 hours that I'm kind of impressed that David didn't immediately go and kill Bathsheba. That's what would normally happen over the course of an hour on a Saturday night between 9 and 10 when basketball isn't on. And it would be the mystery we'd figure it out, and finally they'd trace the cell phone coverage to pin David there whenever Bathsheba actually died, and we would know, ah, oh, it was the king that did it. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he devises what is actually the most reasonable and loving plan possible. Let's call Uriah back, pretend like we got some business, send him home so he can have some business, and then he'll go back to the field and everybody think the baby is his. Brilliant. And so Uriah comes back, they talk. David says, hey, you've been in battle for a while. Why don't you go home for a couple days and, and, and enjoy and celebrate and see your family, and then we'll send you back. But Uriah, a, a man of nobility, refused to partake of the luxuries of home while, while his men were still out on the battlefield. He slept at the door. Now get the picture in that moment. David, the mighty man of God, now acting in inappropriate ways while his men were at battle. Uriah, the insignificant soldier, now acting in the way of nobility, even while the king was sinning. It's a striking contrast in that moment of, of obedience coming from the overlooked one. 
Uriah goes back to the battlefield and David has to come up with another plan. For everybody will know that the baby is his. And so this plan is much more sinister. He sends word out to the front lines, hey, put Uriah at the very front and then pull back. Just, just entrap him. That way he will die. The generals get the commands and they do what the king says. And Uriah is dead. Word comes back and David calls for Bathsheba to become one of his wives. And we don't know. We don't know if she is angered over this or if she is almost complicit in the murder. We don't know. What we do know is that they go to bed that night thinking, we took care of it. But I kind of wonder what was that night like. I wonder, did he have a tough time sleeping? Was there the sense of conviction that he knew? That even if nobody else knew, they knew. He, he thought it was all done. Uh, until one day, another prophet made an appointment with him. And David, being a righteous man, a, a godly man, gave the, the prophet rightful access. We don't know how Nathan knew. He's a prophet. Sometimes they get some insight that the rest of us don't get. Maybe God just said, hey, Nate, you're never going to believe this. But in all likelihood, in, instead of a direct line from God that way, prophets just tend to have this ability to, to see what is obvious, but what we're blind to. You see, we never truly hide sin. You, you think you do. You, you think it's well covered. You think it's well taken care of. But the, the reality is our sin always makes itself known. It, it's why it's so easy on occasion to, to look back and to see the sins of others and to recognize, oh, that's why they were acting this way. Oh, that's why they did what they did here. Oh, this, that's why that happened exactly right here. It's because our sin is always making itself known. Even at this very moment, your sin is seen by God. He can hear it at this very moment. You think you're, you have it all hidden together. And none of us maybe can see it, but God himself can see it. And somebody truly attuned with God here can sometimes not be so caught up in, in trying to cover up their own sin. You see, that's what gets us. We're all so busy trying to hide our own sin that we really don't have time to see everybody else's sin. But if you get somebody so connected with God that they've purified themselves now in the, in the blood of Jesus, and now they might have this ability to look with fresh eyes and go, well, that looks odd. And so chances are the prophet was just a little bit more discerning than the rest. And he knew what had happened. And, and so he comes and imagine the courage, first of all, there. The courage to go before the king and, and, and to accuse him of what he's about to accuse him of. And he walks in and, and he does it in a very brilliant kind of communication kind of way. He just, he just tells a story. He, he said, king, there's... There's these two men from the same town. One is rich and one is poor. The rich man has, has all that he wants, many flocks, many animals, many signs of wealth. The poor man only has this one little baby lamb that he's raised from birth. And, and this lamb has grown up along with the family so much so that it's become a pet. He eats the scrappings off the table and sometimes if if the breakfast doesn't sit well with the mama, will actually cook him his own breakfast. He falls asleep in the poor man's arms. It's, it's all this poor man basically has. And the rich man had a visitor that came to town, and they needed to eat. And in all his flocks and all his herds and all his animals, he was, he was unwilling to sacrifice one of his own animals for this traveler. And so he went and he stole this baby lamb, this, this pet lamb, and he sacrificed it and fed it to his guests. What should happen to that man? David, now outraged at the arrogance of somebody stealing something so, so insignificant to him and so meaningful to somebody else, said, this man should die. And Nathan said, you are the man. Can you imagine the moment? The, the courage to show up was one thing. 
the courage to tell the story was another. Now, I might be overestimating my own ability, but, but I, think, I think I would have had the courage to show up. I think I would have had the courage to tell the story. And whenever David was outraged in the moment, I would have said, now think about that. And I would have made my way out of the room. But Nathan said, you are the man. And it's in that moment that we begin to understand the difference between being caught and ashamed at just being caught and truly being contrite before God. Now, David, in that moment, had he wanted to, he could have just killed the messenger. He should have said, you're out of your mind, away with this man. He could have, in the moment, denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. Has anybody seen me with Bathsheba? Uh, didn't Uriah come home? I don't know what you're talking about. I wasn't even out on the field to give orders. He, he could have, in the arrogance of the kingdom, said, yeah, I did it. She's mine. All y'all are mine. What's the big deal about it? But instead, in that moment, the mighty king humbled himself to the little peasant prophet And he said, I did it. And in response to that story, he writes these words to God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. What's the difference between somebody who's just embarrassed that they got caught and somebody who has a true contrition for their sin? Which politician do you trust? Because outwardly they will all say the same thing. It was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. But, but how do we know? How do we know about ourselves? For we've all been caught. Nobody comes to Jesus without being caught. Without, without having their sin called out. Without feeling the shame and public embarrassment of, of having done wrong. Of having gone the wrong way. The, the Bible calls us out. The Spirit calls us out. And, and says, you are treasonous to God Himself. We've all been caught. So what's the difference between just being embarrassed that we got caught. And true con contrition before God. I think it is as simple as. Owning the sin. David owned it. He didn't deny it. He didn't make excuses about it. He didn't use kind of the Bobby Knight excuse of, yeah, that was wrong, but look at all the good I've done. So the scales of justice should equal out. He didn't downplay it. Well, well, it really wasn't that important. Even in your own story, you said this was a poor man with just one little lamb. I mean, there's a bunch of poor people. What's the big deal about that? He, he, he didn't begin to blame his family. Well, you know, when I, when I was raised, I wasn't held much as a child, and, and so I have this condition now. He didn't. No. He said, I did it. And then he took that sin and took it to God and threw himself at the mercy of God. And that is the sign of somebody who is truly contrite. No excuses. No justifications. But owning it, and then humbly and obediently taking it before God, and walking with Him. Now, now had, had David just owned it in the moment and then in the years to come, not in any way been obedient to God and repeated this behavior over and over and over again, we would have known that this was simply a spiritual act that really didn't count. 
But his life began to prove that his contrition was real, that his confession was sincere. And God is so good and so loving that he can restore even a sin-filled heart whenever it is fully given to him. But here's our problem. We don't own it. We don't own it. We deny it. We downplay it. We excuse it. And when trapped, we confess enough of it to appease, but not to truly surrender. And God is more than willing to cleanse a heart that is totally given to Him. But He is unwilling to do a partial cleansing. He demands it all or nothing. For David, it was all. In the midst of giving his all, he found freedom. For many of us, it is part, and in the midst of giving just part, we are shackled by our own shame and sin. Ed could tell you, he's experienced it far more times than I have, but somebody comes in my office, comes in our office, and they've been caught. The affair has been revealed, the addiction has come to light. The the fraud is about to hit the papers. And there are some who leave that office, and I think to myself, they have no chance. Because as they sit there, all they talk about is their family of origin, what their spouse didn't do, how difficult their life has been. And at no point do they take personal responsibility for their part of what has taken place. But there are other people who sit in my office at the lowest point of their life. And I thank Jesus because I know they're fine. I know they're about to suffer in ways they can't even begin to imagine. But I know that they are more healthy in this moment than they have been in decades. Because even while their name is trash in the headlines, they are right before God. Because their response is, here's what I have done. Lord, help me. Which one of those two people are you today?